cool. I wanted to look at some Toy Story today because this is a beautiful piece. <sighs> Yay. Um, so let's do some yes. recap. Um, what intervals are a major chord made up of? From the first to the second note, from the second note to the third note. What's our first interval? Perfect fourth. Not quite, just off by a major semitone. Third. Yep, major third, just to denote the uh, major the major third, third uh, tonality, the major tonality. And what's the interval between the second note and the third note? Minor third. Minor third, cool. Minor. And then if I flatten the three, I get minor third on one and I get a major third on the other. So they just invert themselves, yeah? Because we just simply move a note. Uh, in order for me to get an augmented chord, I start from my major chord and I augment or, or sharpen the fifth. And then, so that gets me a major third and then major third. Are you happy with that? Two major thirds. And how many semitones is a major third? Those playing at home? One more time. Four? Yep. Six. So what? I get one, two, three, four. Yep. <laughs> in today's society. <laughs> and then um, to build us a minor, oh sorry, a diminished, we flatten the third, flatten the fifth. And so what intervals do we have there between the first and second note? Oh, there's a green sleeves there, whichever one the green sleeves is, minor third. Yeah, and then the next one? Minor third. Uh, perfect fourth. Minor third. No, minor third. Minor third, yeah, yeah, yeah. So. So um, good, good to bring some oral into it, actually. Um, so Green Sleeves is the, the song that we can use to identify the minor third. Uh, oh, whatever the harmony is. I don't actually know. Oh, it's just C minor. Right. And then you can also build it up into a different key if you want. So yeah, two minor thirds. That's your minor third. Minor third descending is Hey Jude. Um, um, <laughs> Yeah, if you depends how familiar are with that song, just sort of out of thin air. Uh, good. All right. Well, let's have a look at this piece. Um, this is when she loved me, and I just think it's got quite, quite beautiful harmony. So we start. Oh, that's not good. Come on, technology. Do what I want you to do. <laughs> so the minim, uh, we get uh, minims just for introduction, and we get a lot of inversions here. So our first chord is a B minor, and just look at this voicing. It's quite interesting. Um, the, the, when, when I use the term voicing, it's it's just a way of shaping the chord, or uh, yeah, shaping the chord in a particular way. So generally, we see a B minor. We might just play it in root position. And this B minor is in root position, so the lowest note is a B, uh, which makes it root position. But we've got, um, what's the interval between the lowest note and the second note in the whole chord? This is um, up in the difficulty here, guys. <laughs> so this... Wait, which on which stay are we talking about? So, so yeah, the entire, the entirety of, of both both staves. So, so, so in reality, um, I don't really oh, see... Oh, so it's... Too, a yeah, yeah. One, so it's a B to an F. B to an F. Perfect fifth. Perfect fifth. Sharp. Is that what you're talking about? Correct. So we've got a B to an F sharp. And what key are we in? Sharp. Oh. F sharp major. Mm. Not quite. Very. B sharp minor. F sharp minor. B minor. B minor. B minor. Cool. Yeah. Great. So we get the last sharp in the list. Which excellent child got yeah, that no. right? <laughs> Rockstar, so yeah. Nice. Did you know that? It's or? great. No, they, they phoned a friend. Um, <laughs> so we see the two sharps, and then we get the last sharp, and we, we sharpen that by a semitone. And so the last sharp oh, in the list is a C sharp, and then we raise it to D, and it's the it's B minor, so it's, it's, it's the relative minor to D major, which means that every C and F is going to be sharpened within the piece, and the to tonal center, when I refer to tonal center, it means the... Generally, when we're referring to tonality, it's referring to whether something's major or minor, just in a very basic sentiment. Um, the tonal center of this piece is going to be centered around uh, B minor rather than D major. Okay, so it's not a, it's not a major sounding song um, for the most part. Well, this is before even going into the actual verse. The verse does start on a major chord. But at the beginning, we've got B minor, which uh, 
instantly kind of gets us a sort of sound of sorrow and sadness, uh, which can set the scene for the song. Uh, so we've got a perfect fifth. What is this interval between the F sharp and the D? Let's, so I'm just going up the chord. D. Yeah, like an augmented fifth. Cool. I think it's Alexa said it as well. Um, yeah, it's a six. What kind of six? Minor. It's minor. Yeah, cool. So from the from the minor minor scale. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah. Can you say it's okay? So we've got the first interval, yeah. which is perfect fifth. And then we've got the second note to the third note is a sixth. Okay, uh, a, a minor six, which is um, eight semitones. Okay, but if we can, you just remind me why that's a minor six, not a perfect six. So the the opposite of a minor six would be a major six. Um, oh, so perfect yeah. intervals don't have any inverse. But um, uh, as for why, uh, if if I move from an F sharp to a D sharp, that's a major sixth, just objectively. Okay, so nine semitones, one note to the next note is a major six. So in the key of F sharp major, that's the sixth note, okay? So it's a major six. It's a six, six degree of F sharp major. But because this note here is an F sharp to a D natural, it's one semitone less than a major six. So therefore it's a minor six. Yeah, it's a bit hard because F sharp is probably the key that we're least familiar with generally. So it's kind of hard to sort of pull out a minor six out of thin air, but um, the more you're familiar with these keys, uh, the better. And we'll, we'll find some other six later. Um, and, and then what's our last interval? D to F sharp. Minor. Do you know that? One more. Major third. Major, Major third. third. Yeah. Cool. Major third. Cool, 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 cool. So we've got this like um, upper, you know, this right hand chord that sort of alludes to a D major. You know, you've got an F sharp there, you've got a D there. And then you've got the left hand doing a, a B natural. Okay. So it's got contents of a D major chord, but that B note in the lowest note really pulls the tonality to make us feel a sense of B minor, a sense of uh, sadness and solemn. And, and we've got the tempo text there saying tenderly, very freely. So when playing this, um, you, you would tend to not want to plant the chords in a very metronomic sense. You'd want to actually plant them with um, each of them have, has their own breath. So I would, I would play the first chord. And that's my own choice to slow down just a little bit towards the fourth chord in second bar. Um, rather than one, two, 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 two. I do believe it's probably more akin to that in the recording though. That's just me being a romanticist though. <laughs> so we've got a pedal in the first bar, okay? Um, who can identify the pedal or the pedal point? It's only for one bar, so it's technically not a pedal point, but why not? Sorry, did, did I miss uh, the F sharp? The F sharp. Is that the F sharp? Yeah, the is F sharp. So, so the idea of a pedal point or a pedal is that the, the idea or the note um, uh, uh, m more or less uh, weaves its way through the content that's moving around it. So the F sharp is constant within the first bar. Um, it's a bit of a stretch to call it a pedal point, but um, at least from, from the listener's perspective, the F sharp tends to fade into the background as they become accustomed to that, that sound repeated. So we get that first chord. And then all that moves is the interval on the bottom and the middle note in the in the right hand. Okay. You can tell me what that interval is. What is it? <laughs> Which one? So we've got uh, an A at the bottom and the C sharp in the middle of the chord of the second chord. So you can see on the on the keyboard, I'm playing an A below middle C. This is a complex one. So um, if I brought the C-sharp down an octave, what interval is it? Can you see that on the keyboard? Yeah, uh, it's okay. Yep, yeah. major third. Major third. And so when I bring it up the octave, they then get referred to as compound intervals. So we have simple intervals, which is just um, one to two, one to three, one to four, you know, it just goes within the octave. When we get compound intervals, it's an amalgamation of the simple uh, as well as adding on to it. So there's um, there's a couple of schools of thoughts of looking at this, but but in a general sense, uh, this this here is a is a major tenth interval. Yeah. Okay. 
So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And generally, we will be found in sort of our orchestrations in like cello and 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 uh, relationships in the strings. It can be quite a nice open sound. So, do you call that like a compound major third? Yeah, you could refer to it as a compound major third. Um, okay. I think that's one school of thought. Um, and generally, if I was talking about it, just sort of colloquially, well, not even colloquially, but in passing, I guess, I would just refer to it as major tenth. I just talk about it as a major tenth. That That's just because that's what I'm used to. And um, it's such a common interval in a lot of the music that I play. So I'm just very accustomed to it. Uh, but in a, like a purely theoretical context, sometimes if you have like a, a, a test or something, you just got to check the curriculum and you know, see what they refer to it as. Um, but it is compound because it just goes above the octave. So it's adding the octave plus what it is down an octave. Um, the reason I point that out, um, aside from the fact that it's just nice to know, um, is just that we can get an understanding of these moving voices, you know? So the F sharp is just static, right? Or, or a constant rather. But then we have this 10th moving interval. So it's, it's moved from the B to the D and then it just steps down and then it steps down again. It's really beautiful. You know, it's such a, such a, uh, a very, very minimal movement, but it, it, it denotes uh, so much character and so much emotion in, in just that much. Now, so we've got our, um, just to confuse you a little bit more, the first interval. Tell me, can you guys tell me what type of tenth this is? So this is the B to the D in the first beat. What, what, what sorry? What kind of compound interval? Oh, what kind of tenth, sorry? What kind of tenth interval is this? A minor. Yeah, minor, minor tenth. So, so, so the B to the D, just a down an octave, it's just a minor third. And so I bring it up an octave, it's a minor tenth. Okay, and then I step down again. This A to C sharp is generally a major third, but it's, an, it's, it's a part by an octave, so it's a major tenth. Okay. The intervals, if you count the interval, sorry, if you count the semitones between each of these notes, there'll be one less. Okay, so this interval, the first interval, has one less semitone than this interval from distance to distance. So that doesn't make it a major ninth then, not a major tenth or a minor? Uh, which one are you referring to? The B to the D? The A to C sharp. This is a tenth because the A to A is, is an eighth and it's then a, a nine ninth. and then a tenth. Uh, because but then okay so for example say if it was referred if you were doing i don't know if you were doing a to b it's still above the octave does that make it a is that a ninth then nine. or is it yeah. okay that's okay great. cool sorry that's yeah sorry great that makes sense so like if i was looking cool. at c major for example that's a perfect octave octave this is a major nine this is a minor nine this is a major ten this is a minor ten so it's exactly you know you sort of take the same uh principle uh perfect what are we up to 11 <laughs> uh augmented 11 if you will uh perfect fifth oh, sorry uh what are we up to 12 yeah i generally don't refer to it it's usually for, for from a jazz perspective usually we're only referring to uh what is it 9 9 11 and 13 13 sorry and sometimes we occasionally refer to the 10 so we've got that B minor shape, really nice voicing. It's not too cluttered, you know, not all the notes are sort of close together. They're nice and spaced apart. And then we step down and then we have that E7, okay? What are the notes in our E7 chord? Just in root position, what's required? Bottom note? E. e. Yeah, just don't worry about the music for now. So we've got an E, what's the next note? G. G. G sharp. Mm, it's a magic chord. Yeah, good. G sharp. What's next? Uh, B. B. B7. Then D. D. There is my minor seven interval. Okay. So major seven interval, minus seven interval. Now, when you're playing an, an any seven chord that doesn't have the word major, you flatten the seventh. Okay, you don't play a major seven interval. All right, so I see E7, uh -huh. I play an E chord, and all I'm doing is adding a minor seven interval to the top from from relative to the bottom note. Okay, 
Otherwise, you're just building up a minor third from the fifth note. So many different ways of looking at it. But an E7 is E, G sharp, B, D natural. Any questions on that? I'm sorry, can you just clarify when you do and don't flatten mm. the seventh? So generally, the only time you're going to play the major seven is if the chord symbol says E major seven. Then okay. you play you. a D sharp. But in most other cases, and, and just from what we've found over the past few weeks, um, when you see the seven, it, it is always implying a minor seventh interval, unless okay, there is cool. the word major. Or a triangle, mm -hmm. in 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 instead of the word major, in most jazz charts, and this is an inverted chord. So, what inversion is it? First, first. yeah, because root position is when the E is on the bottom, and then first inversion is when the G sharp is on the bottom, and then second, and then third. All you're doing is just altering the lowest note by just taking it to a different uh, chord tone, okay? So each of these notes are chord tones. All you're doing is just making the lowest note a different one, and it just changes the sound a little bit, okay? And what's interesting about this E7 G sharp over G sharp is that they've removed the G sharp from the right hand, which is quite common practice when we're doing uh, uh, voice writing. We, sometimes we don't want to repeat certain notes. Um, and in this context, they've actually made the G sharp on the bottom, mm. mostly to get the melody from. So, so there's an inherent melody happening here in the in the left hand from the B. Yeah. So it's not, it's, not a, it's not a big deal, but there's a the melody there still, you know. And so when when uh, doing the right hand on top, so I'm going to play the bottom note and the top note. So the bottom, the lowest note and the highest note, which is nice to kind of get an idea, especially when you're doing choral stuff, to get an idea of how your part fits in the middle or if you're on top or bottom. So we get. So what pulls the most attention? What 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 grabs your attention the most out of those two melodies, so to speak? You can play them again if you wish. Have a listen. What's going to draw your attention the most? The accidentals, because they sound out of place. They sound a bit out of place. There's a bit of tension being created, um, which we'll talk about in just a moment. Um, and there's movement. The, the, there's a, the accidentals are there because the, the the notes are moving and 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 due to movement we we just we naturally gravitate to any form of movement whereas the top note it's not really doing much it's the same note same note and then a slight move there so this can actually inform your part singing as well as uh, when you're accompanying someone because all of a sudden you gain so much more information on where the melody sits in the piece in which case if you're singing that part, for example, or if you're playing that part, you're going to draw it out just a little bit more. But more importantly, if you're singing against that part, you're going to allow that part to be drawn out. So therefore, you get more information about how your part sits. Because if I was, you know, if, the, if this was, you know, SATB, I would encourage, you know, sopranos to, um, uh, ooh, hello, to be quite soft relatively soft but it's not it's not so much about dynamics it's about listening you know it's about the sopranos actually listening to either you know that alto part or, or male part that's stepping down as soon as someone listens to another sort of object that just gains a bit more attention and it can it can just live a little bit more okay we don't need to work too much harder because the music is already there and it's already telling us to do that um but it's kind of sweet when we can actually see that movement and then we see a bit more movement in the middle so there's the moving lines. The second note of the right hand and the bottom note. Everything else is kind of just there for, I don't know, a bit of color. Okay, any questions on that so far? Just a little bit of insight, just a bit of um, score analysis, I guess. It's a lovely intro. So simple, so simple. So we've got the B minor. If you're just reading the chords, then you see F sharp over A, which means that the lowest note you're going to play is going to be an A, say if you didn't have time to read the notes. Uh, and then an E7 over G sharp, say if you didn't have time to, to pull out the seven because you're just playing in real time and you're working with a student or something. 
um, you're going to play an E chord with a G sharp on the bottom and not stress too much over that seven if you can't sort of, you know, if you can't sort of call upon it straight away. Um, and then we move to our G minor. Okay, which is the f minor four of D major. Okay, this is a really juicy chord. All right, so we've got D major. Each of these notes has its own chord. Okay, so if you stack thirds, you're gonna gain. You each of those notes will gain a chord. Now it's quite common in in gospel folk music. Um, Quite, quite a lot of different music to, to, to actually move to the minor four chord. So, so this is one, this is two, it's a minor chord. This is three, minor chord. This is four. Generally the four chord in, in a major key is a major chord, okay? But in this context, they've made the G a G minor. And um, we'll see if we can do some more assessment, but um, there's so much in JRB, so much in, in tons of gospel music. Um, Prince of Egypt, I reckon, has um, a lot of that. So you get this like D major. We're gonna go to A major. Yeah, it's a bit lame, sorry. Back to D major. We're gonna go to G major. And I've just minorized it, <laughs> for lack of a better word. So I went, I went to major. That's a major nine. Okay, so that's G, major seven. And now I'm going to keep that major tonality, but actually just flatten the third. <laughs> and in context, it sounds okay, you know. Okay, it creates a bit of a cadence there. Um, that's slightly complex stuff, but hopefully <laughs> that had a place in your brain. Do so you have any questions so far? Any burning? we got a few minutes. Another five minutes. I keep sort of working through the score, but what do you guys reckon? Any requests? You happy for me to just keep <laughs> keep talking about the score? All right, cool. So now the funny thing is, is that um, my on my initial analysis of this piece is um, I see B minor, but then straight away it modulates. And I want to say it modulates, even though we're in the same key, it actually shifts the tonal center to D major, okay? Um, am I bear with me for two seconds. There we go. And now we're in D major, okay? So it's just alluding, it's just, it's just sort of giving you, it's a bit of foreshadowing to be honest. And then we're back in. Now, these beautiful intervals. Okay, we've got sixths. They're moving sixths. Really pretty. Uh, if you honestly, if you if you've really familiarized yourself with the major six and minor six interval, um, uh, it will often sound pretty in any sort of improvisation or. Um, you know, hear a lot in uh, Christmas carols as well. Um, it's also the inverse of a minor third. Uh, sorry, a ma minor and major third interval. So you got um, this six here. If I invert it, it's going to be. A major third. But if I invert it back again, it's going to be a minor six. So it's actually, this is just a, a little a seemingly complex concept. Um, but if I have a major third here and I invert it and put the C up an octave, it's going to become a minor six. So what's happening here is um, this, my, my original music teacher used to describe it as kind of the, the sort of this nine rule that 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 uh, three and six add up to nine. Um, but I'm kind of not going to go down that path for just two moments. But I just want you to kind of just 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 sort of um, work with the fact that this major third, as soon as I invert it, I invert, I actually convert the major to a minor, and then I minus three from nine, and then I get six. <laughs> But that's more for, I think it helps more when you're looking at written intervals. 
but do know that when we invert a major and a, uh, sorry a third and a six, the major and minor actually just swap. That's just a, like that's a rule that happens out of just a result. So if I have a minor third here, F F and A minor, if I invert it and bring the F up an octave, it's going to be a major six. Okay, it was a minor third, but now it's a major six. Just a nice sort of quick way of working out what the interval is. So I'm going to look at this interval here. So we've just started with, we've got this beautiful 10th. This is the third bar. And then the second quaver of that, that bar. Six. What kind of six is it? Do you know what kind of six it is? Major? Not a major. But what I'm going to do is move the C sharp up an octave. My keyboard stopped working. Major third, so Correct. it's a minor six. Correct. Yeah, that's it. Sorry, the display stopped showing now. Yeah. But that's correct. So so it it, it inverts up to a major third and then I work I work my way back again, and then I just change the major to a minor, and it's and I've acknowledged that it's a sixth interval. Cool. Um, I'll just play through a little bit as we as we finish off, because um, all my tech has stopped working, which is great. <laughs> play that at the beginning. Fermata, which is to pause, and then we wait. You notice the accompaniment doesn't have the melody in here. Um. Sorry, guys, it stopped showing for you guys, but it's a nice listening exercise, I guess. Lastly, when we when I speak of when I use the term motif, just a recurring idea that comes back and forth that might um, that might be modified in some way, but in this case, it's actually exactly the same, just for a bar. Whereas the original motif goes for two bars, the next one that occurs after the first verse just only occurs for one bar. So just a little alteration there. Cool, guys. We've come to the end of our wee little drop-in session. Uh, any questions before we head off? <laughs> oh, bye. <laughs> you guys are sweet. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. I'll see you guys on Wednesday. I um I've just got some commitments on Tuesdays now, so um so yeah, but I'll, I'll see you on Wednesday if you want to join us or Thursday. Cool. See ya. Thank you. Um, so just yeah. question on what are you saying? So it's in D. Are you saying, that, are you saying the first um two bars are almost like slightly out of because it's a minor. Yeah. So so oh, look, it's minor. it's still the whole thing is in D major, right? But the first two bars yeah. are are centered more around B minor. Now B minor is just the relative of D major. So it's not it's not completely in a different world. But at the same time, it's not completely of the same world. It's quite it's quite it's quite a purposeful thing for the composer to say I'm going to give you two bars of some B minor color. And then I'm going to shift gears yeah. and go to D major. Okay, the contents are the same. When I say the contents, the the key is the same. Um, the notes in B minor and D major are the same. Okay, they're they're both the same key signature. They have the same components, the building blocks. Okay, but because I shift the tonal center to a B minor, all of a sudden I get a a, a, a big difference. But yes, yeah, that that's that's perfect way of looking at it. It's not in a different planet, but it's slightly just. Just a slightly off to the side. But it's the same. It is the it is the same um, flat. Uh, sorry, um, same sharps. sharps. Yep. Or flat. So it's like because yeah. commonly, <laughs> you know, in a lot of uh, classical music or the, the general rule of thumb would be okay. We're in B minor. Uh, you probably wouldn't lead to G minor from a, a G B minor from a G minor chord. But say for example, then the the song would just be in B minor. You know. 
Dude. Yeah, I'm trying to minorize it. So, so I'm giving you an, an idea of what the song would sound like in a, a minor uh, sound, but it's actually written in a major tonality. Yeah. So, so, so from a storytelling perspective, the first two bars is going to give us some information that actually, you know what, this piece is not just sort of happy-go-lucky, we're having a great time. Um, whereas if it started with just that D major introduction, maybe it would actually elude something different. <laughs> but because we have that... Um, <laughs> cheeky. Um, but... but Hey girls, hey girls, you guys got to be quiet because um, Danielle is talking, yeah? He's teaching He's teaching everyone. So the moment you start speaking, like, everyone else can't hear, just so you know. <laughs> That's great. Um, so, yeah, we have two bars of B minor and then we move to D major. But um, the sharps are the same. The notes that are in B minor and D major are the same. Um, it's kind of like, I actually see this introduction as if, like someone's taken as if the song has already started already as if the song has started for a good two minutes and someone's just went and got some scissors and just chopped it and say we're gonna we're gonna start there but that's me with my musical director hat on going okay how do we land into this song and where have we just been it's it, we're not just beginning when we start the song we're actually we're starting with a motif um which kind of sounds a bit unfinished and like it's just come from something else so Anyway, that's just a bit of musings. Does that cool. give you a bit of an idea? Yeah. Any other questions, friends, before we duck out? Thanks for joining us. Good to see you, Jess. Hi. Good to see you, Marissa. Sorry, I was late. I have went for yeah. <laughs> Didn't get back in that's time. That's all right. It's good to have you. How did you find some of this content? I was Um, I feel like. Today was a bit of a sit back and absorb it, and tomorrow will be a more of a questions day. That's Sorry. Fine. Don't apologize. All good. I won't be here tomorrow, though. Just I'll be here on Wednesday. Okay. Yeah, check out the okay, Wednesday. page if you need a bit more information on that. Uh, yeah, I need to suss those emails yeah, you emails sent through. Um, yeah. There's some Facebook events I can invite you to. Depends what your style is. Help. Everyone's got a different style, you know? <laughs> And I'm going to spend more time on my technology. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like, it's just randomly, it's just kind of, nah, dude, nah, I'm not interested. I'm just going to stop working right now. Uh, how'd you go, Caitlin? Mm -hmm. This is all sort of, you know, all this. Yeah, I think it's a bit of, it's making me go, oh, I really need to like look through my old theory books because I'm just not as quick at like, I used to be able to be like immediately identify what intervals yeah. were and positions and all that kind of stuff and I'm like oh I just need to yeah, of course. look through it that's but that's okay and it's interesting the more you play the, the easier it, the more it helps but to be honest I mean yeah the more you yeah. sing the, the more it helps I mean that that is a powerful tool as soon as I move away from the piano I'm <laughs> I feel like my whole security blanket is gone <laughs> so the more you sing the better yeah um and those six intervals are tricky you know. Anyway, how about yourself, Marissa? Um, I'm good. I find a really interesting um, ways that you explain things that maybe I haven't heard.